こんにちはあの伊藤浄一です千葉工業大学変革センターのセンター長です今日は英語であのやりますであの今日レコーディングをして後であのネットにアップロードしますはい、I'm Joey Ito I'm the director of the Center for Radical Transformations at Chiba Institute of Technology and、uh, this is another one of our speaker series and I'm honored to have two uh, speakers uh, here today、uh, the first speaker will be Yasuhito Sekine He's the principal investigator and professor and director of the Earth and Life Science Institute at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And Ariel Ekblaw, one of my former students from the Media Lab, who's the director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative and the PI for MIT's、uh, lunar mission and founder and CEO of the Aurelia Institute. Thank you for coming. So I'd like to start first with a presentation from Sekine san. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, and、uh, thank you, Ariel.、Uh, and also, thank you for inviting me here.、Uh, I'm Yasu Sekine, the director of Arts Life Science Institute. So we call LC or Institute. And、uh, my talk is about how to find life beyond the Earth. So before talking about this, we need to think about this. Why do we go to the space? Because my talk is about space exploration, and Ariel also. Speak about the space exploration. So, why do we need to go to space and why do we need to think about space? So, I think there are several reasons, but the most important reason is we need to obtain the new views from the space. New views from the space that could not be obtained only from the ground. The, what type of new views we can obtain from space? So, for example, one example is the, the view about the where we came from, about the, our origin. And another view is the who are we, that's the identity of ourselves. And the last one is the, the view where we are going, it's the, our future. So, the Hybris 2 spacecraft.、Uh, Bring the sample to Earth, and、uh, those samples contain the evidence of water and also organic materials. And、uh, those materials probably provided on Earth, on early Earth, and、uh, could provide some role for the origin of life and the formation of Earth's atmosphere and the ocean. So now we know that if we consider, if we try to consider our origin, where we come, came from, that we need to think about the Earth. As a part of the, the planet of the solar system. So, we need、uh, some view from the space about our origin. And、uh, the second point the, the our civilization or cu culture affects globally. So, in order to see the whole picture of ourselves, human beings, we, we clearly need the view from the space to see ourselves. And the last one is、uh, our future. And the other <laughs> will provide the, the, the talk about our future. So, I'm going to talk about the first topic where we came from, the how we can understand our origins from the space exploration. So, my research topic is、uh, the, it, it's not a research topic, but the, my、uh, life theme <laughs> <laughs> is,、uh, or my dream is、uh, searching for life beyond the Earth. To understand whether we are special or common in the space and how we emerge d on our Earth. So, I think the important thing is searching for life beyond the Earth is important to understand our origin because the evidence, geological evidence or biological evidence for the origin of life on Earth, is already lost. Due to the surface geological activity on Earth. So, in order to understand the environment of the, the ancient Earth, Hadean Earth, we need the information from the space. So, how to discover life beyond the Earth? So, do you think whether we can discover life beyond the Earth? I, I'd like to ask this question to the audience, including the, the in front of the laptop computers. <laughs>、mm -hmm. Maybe it's shared to light a hand, but、uh, yeah, the discovery is very important. Probably there are lots of life in the universe. The universe is so wide, and even in the solar system, we have the, some planets that have o c e a n atmosphere, and exoplanets. We know that the billions of the, probably there are billions of 
Earth-like planet orbiting around the different stars. So there should be life there. But the important question is whether we can discover life. So in order to discover, we need to recognize life based on some evidence, some evidence. So what kind of evidence is definitive evidence for the life beyond the Earth? So please imagine that you are clue member of human mass exploration. <laughs> and uh, you landed on the surface of Mars and uh, investigation, do the investigation on the outcrop of Mars, and then you find this. What do you think? <laughs> do you think it's uh, definitive evidence of life? I, th I think so. Yeah. 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 It's really hard to make this feature yeah. by abiotic process. So if we find this, oh, I, I would feel that the, oh, I, I can find life on the Earth. Mm -hmm. But in reality, in reality, you may find this. So the dark materials and uh, the here are organic materials. And light materials, the surrounding dark materials, it's the uh, rock minerals. So do you think this is a solid, definitive evidence of life on Mars, if you find this? It really hurts to say yes. So this is a very famous picture. The taken by geologists, that he find these materials in a deep sea sediment, 3.5 billion years old deep sea sediment, and he found that when we, he found this, that he said that he find the, the first fossil of life on Earth. But the, some geologists, other geologists or organic chemists, um, or his opinion that those organic materials can be produced by abiotic process. Mm. So even until now, it is still uncertain whether this is real Earth's earliest life fossil. So it really hurts to define what is life. And what about this? The, the, this is also a very fam famous picture, and uh, some of you may probably have seen this. The, in the central part of this picture, you can see the warm-like warm features. That this is the uh, organic materials, but the size is much smaller than the previous one. The previous one's size is ab about uh, comparable to the diameter of our hair, but uh, this one is much smaller than these organic materials. So the, this one is organic materials and the surrounding these uh, mineral materials. And this was found in the Martian meteorite. Martian meteorite. Martian meteorite came from uh, Mars, and uh, the un impact occurred on the surface of Mars, then the surface materials, the, the flow, and the finally reached to the Earth. And the mineralogi mineralogists, they investigate the Martian meteorite, and the, he found the, these materials. The, the people who find these organic materials, the, they claim that the, this is the uh, evidence of Martian life, but uh, of course, the many scientists uh, did not agree, did not agree. Then it really hurts to show the definitive evidence of life beyond the Earth. So Carl Sagan said the extraordinary claims requires extraordinary <laughs> evidence. So you know that the claim of extraordinary claim, like a, a finding of extraterrestrial life, needs definitive evidence. The definitive evidence is uh, when we See, we mean the, even in the people in the U.S., people in the Asia, people in Europe, or people in Africa, the young or older, the many people consider that this is life. So that's a extraordinary evidence. So how we can get those extraordinary evidence? That's a really fundamental question. And we don't know the building materials of, of life beyond the Earth. So it's really hard to consider. So, but if you correct the sample on the surface of Mars, the soil sample, and uh, you bring the sample to the Mars base camp and the, the water, the sample, then you can, if you see these materials, what do you think? I think this is a definitive, right? <laughs> the evidence of life, because it's moving, it's so active. So if we see the activity of life, then the we can see 
uh, we can understand this is the definitive evidence of life. So the question is, uh, why can life be active? Why can life be active and moving? The biologist uh, Shinichi Fukuoka said that uh, life is in dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium means that uh, your the body's carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, or oxygen, all of those elements that create life need to be replaced in a short time. Otherwise, the, the, those materials will not work correctly. And those materials need to be transported to life through geochemical cycles. So I think that the, the your, I mean, you are probably the same as the one in the previous one, one years ago, but the, the element that you make your body is uh, fully replaced through the geochemical cycle. So in other words, the life can be active by obtaining the energy, nutrients, and building materials from surrounding um, subsystems like uh, ocean, soils, and the atmosphere of life. So life is like a moving oil with an uh, analog uh, clock. And the other clocks, uh, atmosphere, ocean, and the uh, soils, the core of Earth or planets. So these these hoils uh, provide energy and the materials to life, small, small hoil. And owing to this movement of this system, the life can be active, life can be moving. So in order to predict the extra terrestrial life, or in order to cultivate extraordinary life to show the evidence of life, that we first need to know the cycles of materials among the ocean, atmosphere, and the soil. In other words, if other hoils stopped in the, on the, the planetary body, then life could not exist. So I would say that the life can be active. Life can live on the living planet. <laughs> the living planet is that the planet have an atmosphere, the ocean, soils, mm -hmm. and materials that cycling mm -hmm. around the, the planet. So in <clears throat> our solar system, we can find several uh, living planets or satel satellites. The one is icy ocean worlds orbiting around Jupiter and Saturn, and the other is the, the red planet, the Mars. So <clears throat> in the outer solar system, there are several icy satellites. The icy satellite is uh, orbiting around Jupiter or Saturn's gas giant and covered with the, the water ice, the surface. But due to the heating, internal heating, the, the, we know that there are subsurface, substantial amount of water uh, beneath the icy crust. We call these the subsurface oceans. And uh, we know that about the several, I mean, nine of icy satellite or icy bodies are known to have a subsurface ocean now. So, and, and uh, about 10 years ago, Cassini spacecraft uh, arrived at uh, Enceladus, the small moon of Saturn, and uh, Cassini found this feature. <laughs> the, this feature is a plume. The, it's really amazing view. The, it's an eruption of subsurface ocean through the crack on the surface of icy moon. So this is really revolutionary finding because the, we know that, that there are subsurface ocean, but the, the ocean is covered by thick ice. So it's really hard to get the sample from the subsurface ocean. But this Enceladus provide the ocean materials the, by itself through the plume activity. So the spacecraft uh, did a flyby to correct the, the, the plume materials for Enceladus, and uh, the spacecraft finds the, the, the carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and silica in uh, the, the plume materials erupting from the Enceladus. So what this means, the hydrogen and the silica would be produced by hydrothermal activity more than uh, uh, subsurface ocean. So hydrothermal activity is really important for life on Earth because this hydrothermal activity provides many nutrients from rhizosphere, from rock. 
So un under the high temperature conditions, the many elements, including the nutrients and the organic material, dissolved into the water. And this provides to the, the oceanic water. So if we go to the deep sea, we could not see any uh, life, usually. But in, in a hydrothermal system, near the hydrothermal system, there is the uh, very special ecosystem, which is supported by the hydrothermal activity. Another possible candidate for the evidence of life is uh, Mars. The current Mars is like a desert planet, dead planet, covered with the, the iron oxide soil on the surface. But about four billion years ago, the Mars is known to have uh, possessed the substantial liquid water on the surface and or in the subsurface. So the NASA's Curiosity rover already landed on the ancient lake sediment. The, you can see the sedimentary rock features, uh, laminars and the, and the rock outcrops. And uh, the Curiosity did drilling and the lake sediment. And we first very surprised to see this material because the surface is covered with red, reddish iron oxide. But the, if we did drilling, it's like a 10 centimeter drilling, but we found very fresh uh, gray mud rock. This is really fresh, and uh, it preserves the information about the lake environment and uh, 3.5 billion years ago. And in uh, these mud materials, we find the clay minerals, organic materials, and the salt materials. And based on this, soil, salts, and organic materials. We can reproduce the water chemistry, I mean composition, pH, and redox state of the wa water on the, the Martian, uh, on, on ancient Mars. The one of the surprising finding by the curiosity is that the Martian organic materials contain a lot of sulfur. It's really surprising because Earth's life contain the carbon together with nitrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen. And so far, it's very minor for Earth's life. But for Mars, organic materials contain almost zero nitrogen, zero phosphorus, but contain a lot of sulfur. So we don't know the origin of the Martian organic materials, but uh, this sulfur-rich organic materials is really special. We could not find those materials in the carbonation meteorite. So probably these were produced on the surface of Mars. So if we consider this, the, this probably reflects the the water chemistry, the sulfur rich chemistry on the surface of Mars. And uh, so this implies that uh, if we find life on Mars, the, their building materials could be enriched in sulfur. So, and this, the, that was the, the story about ancient Mars, but even in the current Mars, the, there could be some activity related to the water or water ice. So this is a very famous uh, geological feature we call the uh, recurring slope linears that appeared in uh, the warm summer season and the slope of the Mars. And you can see the dark feature elongated from the, the slope top to the down of the slope. And some people consider that, that this could be produced by melting of subsurface um, ice during the warm season. And uh, probably the, the availability of uh, ice on Mars will be yeah, talked by the Ariel and later. So spacecraft exploration are proceeding very advanced. The, however, I think the major issue for finding life beyond the Earth is still remaining. The what is the major issue? So since 17th century, since 17th century, the we create the science in the 17th century. And since then, the, we divided science, subdivided science into many disciplines. Mm -hmm. So now we know that the nature is divided into many specialized disciplines. For example, in, uh, I don't know the situation in the US, but uh, in, in Japan, in high school, mm -hmm. the first we learned uh, science in the junior high school. But in the high school, this is some divided into physics, yes. chemistry, biology. geology, and also biology. Mm -hmm. And in a uh, university, undergrad, the physics then subdivided the applied physics, 
-hmm. space physics, <laughs> astronomy, and uh, quantum physics. And in uh, graduate school, then <laughs> astrophysics is subdivided into infrared <laughs> astronomy, <laughs> X-ray astronomy, <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the people who get PhD go to one specific narrow region of the discipline. Mm -hmm. So if we see this material, organic materials, within the Martian meteorite, the first organic chemist subdivides the organic material from rock because the organic chemist usually stops studying the geology since high school age. <laughs> so first, they only consider the organic material. It's the same for geologists. Geologists uh, try to analyze the uh, rock materials, but they usually ignore the organic materials on the surface. But the real important thing is the interaction, interaction between them, because life is a dynamic equilibrium system. So the interaction is the most important thing, but uh, we already divide the nature into many disciplines. So it's really hard to consider the interaction between these things. I think this is the major issue for the finding beyond the life. The, so the life and the earth are interconnected through some material cycle. So the important thing is that to understand the interaction and the flows of materials between them. So in order to address the question on the origin of life or uh, life beyond the earth, the, the real challenge is to integrate our knowledge of subdivided discipline into one. So this is really required for many aspects on Earth. For example, the, the global issues like uh, environmental change. Mm -hmm. the, this is not just a climate issue. It relates to the economics or society or many aspects. And also the COVID virus, COVID virus is also the same. It's, it's not like a, I mean, medical issue. It's closely related to the social issue or the government issue or many, many things. So now we, we are facing those problems, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we already divided the nature or material into many disciplines. So we could not, I mean, uh, make a, uh, we, we could not understand correctly the complex issue like uh, life beyond the earth or COVID or environmental change. So my institute, the Earth Life Science Institute, is try to integrate, try to make a fusion of subdivided discipline into one. So in our institutes, that we have a many wide variety of scientists, from complexity scientists, astrophysicists, mineralogists, geologists, biologists, and the organic chemists. So this wide range of researchers or in the one building on the one roof and the discuss the one important uh, thing and that together. Mm -hmm. So that's a, I think that's a special thing for LC uh, to search for life beyond the earth and also to consider the origin of life beyond the earth. So one possible, uh, I mean one uh, remarkable collaboration is about the collaboration of chemistry, mineralogy, planetary science, also synthet synthetic biology. So in this uh, project, the, we try to predict the possible life, form of life in the uh, icy ocean worlds. So we make uh, artificial life based on the synthetic biology technique. The, it's a kind of the, the life, but it's not real life, it's artificial life. We can change the composition of life. And we make the very wide variety of artificial life, and we put those uh, microbial artificial life into the environment of icy moon, like a high pressure condition in the sea floor, hydrothermal system, and almost a freezing temperature. We do the, the cycling of the environment uh, for the artificial life, for the artificial evolution. So in this artificial evolution, some artificial life could not survive, but some artificial life could survive, and uh, they can evolve under this condition. So we can see the, what component is necessary to survive the icy ocean world, and uh, what building materials is 
favorite to survive in the icy ocean world. That's a warm uh, one ongoing collaboration. Another component, uh, another uh, I mean collaboration is uh, to predict uh, the food for microbial life on Mars. So uh, in this period, uh, in this project, uh, the, it's a collaboration among the environmental chemistry, uh, biology, and also planetary atmosphere and the environmental science. So, and this project, we reproduce the, the cycle, material cycle or, of Mars, and what chemical com component could be, uh, I mean, kind of ox oxygen, a lot of oxygen for us, or what could be the food for the Martian life. So if we can predict the food for life, mm -hmm. the what we can do. So this was taken from uh, a hearted movie of life. It's uh, broadcasted in uh, about uh, several years ago. And this movie is the, the Mars sample return mission done and the sample were provided to the International uh, Space I ISS. It's a yeah, International Space Station mm -hmm. uh, for the planetary protection. Mm -hmm. And the biologists try to cultivate life there. And uh, they provide some nutrients mm -hmm. and also food to the soil. And they found that the, the, the organic materials is moving. I think, uh, yeah, we, we need to first constrain the f what, what is the food for motion life and the what would be the nutrient for la for motion life? Then we can cultivate the life, and the the most promising way to prove life on Mars is the, to go to Mars. I mean, the biologist goes to Mars and do the cultivation there. So I think that the uh, finding life on Mars require not only the science, but also we need the kind of civil engineering and also the space, ex I mean, Mars exploration by human is. So in 2030 or 2040, we may be, uh, in, uh, we, we may be in the age of discovery or non-discovery of life through the space exploration, and uh, including the human Mars exploration. And we know that the Enceladus, Ari Mars, and also Europa, the, the Jupiter's moon, are habitable in terms of the availability of liquid water, organic materials, and also energy, nutrients. So these three bodies, uh, living planets, living satellites. But if we find that uh, if some of them do not have life, what, the question is why they are lifeless. So the, probably the, those lifeless planets or satellites would not have met the condition for the emergence of life because we already have the component of the life and the system that, the, I mean, sustains the activity of life. So the, the, if we find the key, the, those lifeless planets or satellites, we may be able to constrain the key components for the emergence of life. For example, the, the Enceladus and the Europa do not have any atmosphere, do not have any land, but on Mars, the, the early Mars have atmosphere and land. So if we, we find life only Mars, but we could not find any life in Southeast of Europa, we can understand the probably atmosphere or land that those components are required for the emergence of life. So I think that those comparative study of discovery or non-discovery of life and the solar system would provide the most important constraint on the origin of life on Earth and beyond. So Carl Sagan said that the extraordinary claims required extraordinary evidence. The, the extraordinary claims required not only the extraterrestrial life, but it also included the origin of life. To prove the origin of life, it's really difficult because uh, we already lost the evidence. However, through the solar system exploration, we may be able to provide extra ordinary evidence like a presence of life on Mars, but lifeless and sort of so on, or Europa. So that's it. So that, that's uh, what I'm thinking to uh, tackle to the, the origin of life. 
and also extraterrestrial life. And why, that's the reason why we need to go to this space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sekine-san. Um, so maybe we can be s switching. Um, and it was interesting that you talked about this uh, breaking past disciplines. One of the key words that we used at the Media Lab was a word um, anti-disciplinary <laughs> um, and doing research between and beyond existing disciplines. And the Center for Radical Transformation, the Henkaku Center here at um, Chibakoda is also, that's the theme that we're trying to do. So. Um, it was very heartened to hear that, and, and a lot of Ariel's work you. comes from that theme as well. So maybe Ariel, you wanna? Thank you. Me. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joey, for hosting me, and Sakine, thank you for a fabulous talk, a really wonderful way to ground why do we go into space exploration at all. It's lovely to be here with you today uh, in my role as a visiting researcher for the Center for Radical Transformation. Thank you very much for having me. And then also what I'll do today is walk through a series of research projects from our portfolio at MIT, and then all the way through life in space, but a different scale of life in space, building architecture for our own life in space as humans, as we become a space-faring species. So some of you may already be aware, but I think it's useful to call out what makes these next few years in the space industry so important. We are already at a cusp of seeing humans participating in low Earth orbit. So these are two platforms, Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket and Virgin Galactic Spaceship Plane 2 that have already been taking humans up above the technical definition of space into a short, a short microgravity mission and then returning them home. We are, many of us, familiar with the International Space Station, an amazing feat of engineering and international collaboration. But in the next few years, we're expecting a burgeoning presence of new commercial space stations in orbit. This is a really huge transformation, particularly for us in the United States, where space research and space participation in going out and actually exploring has been driven by military defense and government entities for so long. But now we're beginning to see an economy grow in low Earth orbit and actually be able to support more than just science, but also manufacturing, uh, protein folding in a microgravity environment, maybe even entertainment and space tourism. Within this decade, NASA, through the Artemis program, is planning a crude return to the surface of the moon, the first time in decades. And this is something that MIT and my group at MIT is directly participating in. I'll tell you a little bit more um, in the next few minutes. And then, of course, groups like SpaceX, led by Elon Musk, are already planning how would we live as a small-scale settlement on Mars or elsewhere, or in Elon Musk's mind, perhaps a very large-scale settlement. I think the reality of images like this is that life on other planetary bodies for the next several decades will be limited to something like McMurdo, an example of the very extreme environment research station in Antarctica. We won't necessarily be having thriving space cities on the moon or on Mars due to the nature of supply chain limitations with Earth, latency, the difficulty of just protecting human biology in those areas. And so it will be more like very scoped, but still quite exciting outposts for the future exploration. So with that framing around where we are in the space industry and the feasibility of sending humans out into space exploration, I'll now tell you a little bit more about my group at MIT, where we work on, in this great spirit that Sakine-san had already explained and that Joey led while he was at the Media Lab, of interdisciplinary, anti-disciplinary thinking, can we bring together science, engineering, art, and design to really co-design the future of the artifacts for life and space that we all need. So I specialize in building habitats, the actual shell structure that will protect the space flyers, the astronauts, eventually we hope many different civilians who get to go to space. But there's an entire ecosystem around a space habitat that must be designed. Everything from environmental control and life support systems to technologies and tools for mental health for deep duration, long duration space missions to food and agriculture. And some of these technologies, we are really quite excited to see an opportunity for them to come back and benefit life on Earth. So one example is in a space habitat, you have to take CO2 out of the air. You have a human crew breathing a lot of CO2 out into this you know, contained um, air body. 
And so being able to do direct air carbon capture effectively within a space habitat yields a technology path that we may then also be able to scale for the need for direct air carbon capture on an Earth-based context, of course, a much larger scaling problem, to address issues like climate change mitigation and removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's an example of crossover technology that we're excited to explore in both domains. Every year, I charter a zero-gravity flight. Is anyone here familiar with the zero-G flights, the planes that go up and down? So the way that they work is they do what you'd want a plane never to do. They pitch very steeply upwards at 45 degrees, nose over, point towards the ground at 45 degrees. They execute this parabolic arc 30 to 40 times in the sky, so it's like a roller coaster in the sky. And at the top of that parabolic arc, you get 15 to 20 seconds of weightlessness. And this is how NASA trains astronauts, ESA, JAXA train astronauts, but it's also how you can test out in brief moments your hardware and experiments for space. And this is how we train the next space generation and go through our portfolio of research projects. This is an example of just the diversity of backgrounds that are part of this team, designers, engineers, scientists, artists, architects. And we've been really enjoying over the years having a large community that knits together many different parts of MIT. Earth and planetary science, Aero Astro, the Media Lab, Sloan, even for the business school. Again, really thinking about this full ecosystem for life in space. I'll now show a couple slides that demonstrate the breadth of the technology portfolio. And this is also really a reflection on the breadth of the research interests at the Media Lab, where much like Sakine-san's lab, we have different domains of science, engineering, and design all sitting together in one building. I think it's a really powerful structure for teaming and innovation. My personal expertise is in robotics and self-assembly, but we have researchers working on the future of space manufacturing, zero gravity 3D printing, free extrusion, and in fact, next weekend, we are preparing for a launch to the International Space Station on the CRS-26 mission, that's a SpaceX mission, that will take one of our most recent payloads up to the International Space Station and test resin-free extrusion so rather than taking a very slow 3D printing approach, if you're familiar with FDM, we're excited to use the unique design affordances of microgravity, extrude a beam that will not sag in the way that it would sag on Earth, and also be able to extrude compound structures like trusses. So this might be a way in the future to rapidly fabricate antennas, truss structures, other infrastructure that's being built in situ in space, and after the resin is extruded in this geometry, we flash cure it with UV light. This is another nice opportunity to avoid a heat intensive process, sorry, excuse me, a heat intensive process in space. Again, to be thoughtful here about power budgets and the feasibility of on-orbit manufacturing. A few other things to call out. We're very interested in the future biology of protecting uh, the human body and the thinking about physiology, what other different aspects of astronaut biosensing can we take into space? We're also thinking about the future of space food and had flown a space meso several years ago to try and argue with NASA that we should no longer be relying solely on freeze-dried food for space, but that we could leverage the really rich human history in fermented food products that have a better impact on your gut microbiome and the health for astronaut crews, in addition to bringing much more joy uh, and umami back into your food and your flavor. And so that uh, space food, the caviar algae that you're seeing in the bottom is part of that research thrust. Altogether, this portfolio of over 40 different research projects, I feed them into a launch pipeline. So I like to say you're not a real sp space program if you're not actively launching into space. And we begin projects by testing them on the zero gravity flight. We then take a selection of them that merit this further testing to a suborbital platform where we can get maybe three minutes of microgravity. We've now done over six different payloads to the International Space Station for up to 30 days uh, for some of the missions and up to six months for other payloads. And now we have our sights set on the moon this is an artist's render of a concept that we will be sending to the moon next summer. So I just signed MIT's first ever commercial lunar contract. This means that we did not apply to NASA or JAXA or ESA and go through a space agency to get to the moon. We actually bought our own payload space on a 
private commercial provider who NASA has incentivized to be able to begin servicing missions to the moon next year. We have two payloads of, or three payloads of interest. One that you see here on the ground are these uh, small sensor nodes, the cubes, which use a capacitance model to detect water ice. And we're hoping to understand more information about a historic area on the lunar south pole uh, near Shackleton Crater in the peaks of eternal life where we are expecting to find water. On the top of this rover, you might notice a tiny little swarm robot. You'll see a picture of the real hardware in a moment. This is a swarm robot that is meant to live in symbiosis with spacecraft, inspired by biology and the way that ants live on a tree or ants live on a peony and are part of this shared existence. The idea here with small swarm robots, the size of my thumb, is that they can crawl on the outside surface of a spacecraft in orbit, a spacecraft in a gravity-based environment, even a low gravity environment like the moon, on the surface of a rover or a lander, and pick up defects in the outside of that structure, gas leaks, cracks, uh, damage to solar panels, far before an astronaut would have the time or the wherewithal to be able to detect those types of manufacturing defects or other concerns. So it's a really important servicing and diagnostic capability for the future of space. And then the third payload that we'll be sending next summer is the first ever depth field camera that will be used to capture imagery on the moon. The last imagery that we have of the moon from the surface comes from technology that is you know, decades old from the 1970s. So we're really quite excited to be sending a modified Azure Connect camera. It's a commercial off the shelf camera from Microsoft that we have modified with NASA Ames to be able to be space grade and radiation hardened and will take uh, imagery of the surface of the moon that we intend to then pipe into a virtual reality trainer for the first crew astronauts to return so that they can train on Earth before they're actually in that environment on the surface. And if that was the artist's render, here is the real version that's being integrated out in Colorado right now. The rover that you see is our partner, that's Lunar Outpost's rover. On top of the rover, is our tiny little swarm robot. You can see on the right-hand side a close-up of the robot itself, closed in its packaging to protect it against the vacuum. And then below is a tiny little garage that will autonomously open and release the ro our astro ant, the tiny little swarm robot, release the swarm robot to traverse the upper surface of that rover once it's deployed on the lunar surface. And this time, we're looking mostly at doing a temperature thermal map of the top radiator surface of that rover understanding how that rover is performing in the vast temperature swings on the lunar, in, um, lunar surface when you're either in the sun or in the shade. All of this work that is encapsulated in the Space Exploration Initiative was really thanks to being able to found this under Joey Ito while I was at the Media Lab. And we've now captured this information in a book, if you're interested to learn more, that talks about the full portfolio of the different research projects that we've worked on over the last few years. I'm now going to dive into a more specific project within this research portfolio. This was my PhD research on self-assembling robotics for space. My interest is in building large-scale infrastructure in microgravity, not necessarily on planetary surfaces, but there may be some overlap in the future. The motivation was a study that I performed of all of the existing examples of space architecture. These are all of the ones that have flown from Skylab and Mir and Tiangong to some of the uh, projected next generation spacecraft like the Lunar Gateway up in the upper right corner. And what you'll see is that it's very dominated by one particular geometry. It's small and it doesn't scale. What would it take for us to be able to build architecture like this, a science fiction worthy vision of something like a ring world or really anything at scale that can welcome more humans into orbit? This is the challenge that's presented for how we have built those examples of space architecture previously. While there may be some controlled docking, the final touches and the final repairs are all done manually by astronauts in suits for EVAs, which is an incredibly risky ask of an astronaut. And it is also too slow. The feasibility of maneuvering something like the Canada Arm, for example, on the International Space Station really rate limits the progress and the speed at which we can build. And so instead, 
I turned to inspiration from biology to look for patterns in nature where we see self-assembly with at least enough predictability that you could imagine designing each unit of this structure in a bonding pattern that would let it grow in the way that nature grows with indeterminate growth over time. This example is of course parastiki uh, from a, a succulent on earth, but I'll now show you a video of how a concept like this has informed what might be the future approach for self-assembling space architecture. So this is an artist's render of my tesserae concept. Tesserae stands for tessellated electromagnetic space structures for the exploration of reconfigurable adaptive environments. What you'll see inside this rocket as it leaves Earth and goes to Mars, this is one sample destination. This could also work around any orbiting um, gravity body. You'll see a stack of tiles inside this rocket payload fairing. On the edge of each of these tiles, essentially configured in a, something like a Pez dispenser, we have very powerful electro-permanent magnets. So these are not electromagnets, which require constant power to operate. These are permanent magnets wrapped in a coil that are allowed to assist the tiles essentially in docking and finding each other. But if the tiles dock incorrectly, we pulse current through those magnets, the tiles separate and are given another chance to dock. So this is how we have used magnets as a mechanism for what I say is essentially quasi-stochastic self-assembly. These different pieces here you're seeing are coming together, forming this structure without any propulsion. So there's no explicit guidance, navigation, and control for this structure. It is all through code and sensing that is handled on each individual tile as part of a swarm and drawn in together with the force of these magnets on their edges. I'm gonna pause the video here because it goes on for a little longer, more to show you the science fiction vision of what life inside a space habitat might look like. But of course, there are many, many different versions of what that could be. The critical point for this audience coming from a, a technical place like Chiba is that to get to this vision of actually building hardware like this, of course, takes many different hardware iterations. So we've now flown on two parabolic flights, a suborbital launch, and two International Space Station missions with the hardware evolution that you see on the left-hand side. And to accompany the miniature robotics platform where I'm testing the magnets, the code, the algorithm for self-assembly, We've also built a digital twin simulation that is a, built on a physics ODE, so a rigid body uh, dynamics engine that also has the visualization aspect added and the ability to layer over our robotics execution code. So this is done in the Cyberbots, or sorry, Cyberbotics WeBots platform. This work is built on several prior examples of configurable or reconfigurable self-assembly. So those, the kilobots work that was published in Science several years ago, around a thousand member robot swarm. The Lilybot, which uses magnets, uh, floats on the surface of water to dock and undock a swarm. It requires a water surface. And then Daniela Roos's work at MIT, Pebbles, which showed controllable disassembly. And what we've tried to do with the Tesserae hardware, which I'll show you here, is build a tile platform that can do both self-assembly and self-disassembly. It uses a magnetometer and a proximity signature on the outer edges of the tile to determine, after multiple tiles have come together, whether those are accurate, good bonds for whatever target geometry we're looking for, or if it was incorrectly bonded and therefore needs to activate current through those magnets and pulse off. So again, this is building on several different aspects, combining uh, novel research work into this platform. Here's a picture of a florette of the tiles that self-assembled. Um, this is a picture from the latest test that we did looking back down on the Earth from the cupola. This was done on the AX-1 mission to the International Space Station in April. And we're currently planning our next deployment will be to scale the tiles a little larger, maybe more like the size of a dinner plate, produce 32 of them, 
uh, been a little bit difficult in the last year to be able to source the chips and the electronics for making them, if many of you are familiar with the chip shortage. But we are trying to scale the tiles, deploy 32 of them in orbit, and complete a full buckyball, which is the structure that it completes when the full topology is closed. For the simulation, we have a 20 plus parameter parametric simulation, again, built with the WeBots platform that allows us to assess the dynamics of the self-assembling system based on how much friction there is between the tiles, how much initial momentum or, or uh, velocity we give when we introduce the tiles into the containment member where they're allowed to self-assemble all of these different features that allow us to tune how long we expect the full ball to take before it is closed and assembled. And to show you the more accurate kind of physics modeling of what the systems look like, the artist's render, of course, makes it look like the tiles come together perfectly the first time, but it's a much more stochastic system. They come in, they bond incorrectly, they detect that, they continue bonding until, like a protein, they find that correct bonding site and they catalyze. We are controlling uh, the speed and the number of uh, introduction of new tiles into the system. One of our analyses that's currently under review by Science Robotics is to say, what is the optimum number of free tiles in a given volume for a self-assembly technique like this? The goal with work like this is to someday build structures in space that could be built no other way. And I'd like to show this image from the 1850s, or maybe 1850s or 1880s. This was a conception from Edward Boulay of a cenotaph for Newton, a really grand monument to Newton that was not able to be built at the time it was conceived because the span of a 150 meter arch was too great. You can see the tiny little scale of humans at the bottom. But this is the type of architecture that we could be building in space. We have the science questions answered. It is really a um, question of, to Sakine-san's point, economics, politics, engineering, the wherewithal to pull these projects off. And at least in the United States, we've seen for many years now that it's rather infeasible to assume that a government is ever going to give us the money for something like this at this scale in space, and at least not with the consistency of focus that we would require for more than just one political cycle in the US. So again, part of the interest in self-assembly and this biomimetic inspired modular approach is to imagine that we can grow structures like this piece by piece uh, with only modest resources required for each additional module and go from there to actually realize space structures at scale. And so this brings me to the closing of my presentation, which is the next chapter in the endeavors that I am undertaking for space exploration. I decided we needed a real life Starfleet Academy. This is a reference from science fiction from Star Trek where the space cadets would go to learn how to participate in life in space. But it was also where the technology of spaceships like the USS Enterprise were built in this science fiction conception. So I founded a new organization known as Aurelia. It is a two part hybrid organization. The first focus is really a humanist approach to scaling access to life in space. Can we build space architecture of the future using novel techniques like self-assembly or origami uh, or other types of um, inflatable, deployable structures to really support a larger human population in space? This particular image is a conception that we are working on for rings uh, shaped intentionally like a spiral, like a Fibonacci spiral. But these rings would be able to rotate at variable gravities so that when you're living long duration in space, you would actually be able to have something closer to 1G, which of course is a critical requirement for our physiology and the long-term health of being able to live in orbit. So this organization is built on the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, which you saw in the beginning half of the presentation, and is meant to be a nonprofit focused architecture R&D lab. We'll also work on education and outreach, flying zero gravity flights, bringing people now beyond just the MIT ecosystem, but really from all over the world into this collaboration environment. So if any of you are interested in being collaborators, please reach out because we're actively looking to be able to bring some of the resources and the type of experiences that I've been able to do for MIT to a much broader community and get more people thinking about designing and building for life in space. There's a term that Joey and I had coined together when we were at MIT, which is this notion of the anthropocosmos. This is really critical to the framing of this new research endeavor, which is to say, we all know now about the Anthropocene, this era of human activity 
on planet Earth for better and for worse. What are our responsibilities as future stewards of the space commons, responsibilities and opportunities as we go out into the near neighborhood of our solar system? We're already seeing tragedies of the commons like space debris block our ability to eventually operate uh, in low Earth orbit if it continues apace. And so there are a lot of interesting ethical and, and uh, philosophical questions to be answered. And we will be an organization that are very, trying to be very self-aware of even our own impact within the space industry. And it will also do some policy and think tank work around other topics that are guiding what we hope will be a principled set of actions for being early space actors. I'll show you just a few images of other concepts in our portfolio. This is an example of that modular, kind of deconstructed approach to building a large-scale space structure where each module might be able to fit in a rocket, but can be prefabricated and grown like a protein in orbit to achieve a much larger total available volume. We actually really care deeply about design and making it a life worth living in space. And so often in the space industry, we show people images of what it's like to be inside the International Space Station, and it looks like a science lab. And some of us, myself included, would be delighted to live in a science lab on orbit, but not everyone wants to live in an environment like that. And so we've also been thinking about the finer aspects of architecture and design, like a rose window, something that just delights people. Um, and I think that here in Japan, actually, there's a wonderful traditional culture of ornament and thinking about what makes it a space where you are comfortable and looking forward to being in this kind of ethereal environment. And so there's also, I think, a wonderful opportunity, besides my science and engineering work, to think about the future design of architecture in space that really draws people in. This is another view of that same artificial gravity structure. This is the first major project that we're currently undertaking to do a trade study around. We're specking out everything from the size of these bars, uh, how fast we can spin them, what attitude control is required to actually keep pointed and stable a complex structure like this, all the way down to future bioregenerative life support uh, for structures, or for, sorry, for environments within um, rings like this that would allow humans to stay alive. Um, and with that, I'm just going to close and say, if you want to learn more about the team, it's a very interdisciplinary team. Again, really echoing what Sikine san had said so beautifully before. And if you'd like to reach out, this is how you can reach us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'd like this part can be quite informal. So if people have comments or questions, please jump in. And I'll also give more time at the end. And um, also, if you have questions or comments on each other's stuff, I think yeah. that would be yes. very interesting. I mean, I, maybe we should start there. I don't know, Sekine san and Ariel, if you saw any overlap in, in what you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw many overlapping with uh, Ariel and uh, also Joy. Uh, yeah, my institute, as, as, as I mentioned, they try to promote the interdisciplinary collaborations. Mm -hmm. So, and then, of course, the, the going to space and living in the space or making the new society in the space mm -hmm. also require the interdisciplinary yeah, effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, how we could promote those mm -hmm. interdisciplinary mm -hmm. efforts. Because uh, Joy was the, the director of uh, Media Lab, then uh, I'd like to know how mm -hmm you really promote those interdisciplinary research. Yeah, the same thing, the promoting interdisciplinary yeah. research is really very easy, but doing this <laughs> but is doing really, <laughs> really, really hard. So, yeah, uh, and also I'd like to ask Ariel, for your yeah. team, how do you promote those mm. interdisciplinary researches? Yeah. So maybe I'll start and then you can talk about it really. I mean, I think <coughs> the hardest part, one of the hardest part, there's two parts, I think. One is funding. Mm. So usually government funding is also goes into divisions mm. and you have ministries and you have subdivision, subdivision. And it's usually aligned also with uh, academic publishing and degree programs. And so it's uh, it's almost cliche, but it's everyone learns more and more about less and less. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and and it's very difficult um, for a university mm. uh, to grant a degree in something that's not rigorous. Mm. So rigorous is there is a academic journal and there are peer reviewers and they're making absolutely sure this PhD is deeper than the last one. You know, and, and that's a good way to dig down. Mm. But the problem then becomes 
if you're between disciplines, mm -hmm. um, especially in the space that's actually in between, not just cross-disciplinary, but anti-disciplinary, it's difficult, one, to judge whether this is um, better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's also very unstructured. So especially in Japan, they like mm -hmm. structure and rules. So there you have the, the, the famous people, and then you ha they can judge, right? And it's very difficult to judge creativity there. And so when you are a government, and you're trying to give um, away money responsibly, mm -hmm. and if you're a university and you're trying to grant degrees responsibly, you end up with this kind of hierarchical mm -hmm. structure. And I think the way we did it at the Media Lab, there are several key pieces. So the Media Lab is part of the School of Architecture. Mm -hmm. And architecture is actually about bringing art and science, design, engineering, and it's about the buildings that function, that look good, that make you feel good, that, you know, so that in, in architects in general bring all these pieces together. So it's, it's, a, it's almost like a craft. So that was one piece. So that made it easy for us to just make up a program called Program in Media, Arts, and Sciences, which was quite anti-disciplinary. And then it was the business model. So the Media Lab got corporate funding, not mm -hmm. government funding. And the corporate funding that the Media Lab got was very undirected. So they paid, so we had you know, 100 companies in a consortium, <coughs> and we said, you don't tell us what to do. Media Lab students just do whatever they want to do, <laughs> and if you want, you support it. It's a very undirected funding, and the idea was that we would come up with questions that you don't know to ask, mm -hmm. so we're coming up with questions, and so big companies like Toshiba had this map for, they were sponsored for 30 years, and every five or six years, they see something that they would never have imagined that changes their business completely. Mm -hmm. So the reason that the companies are funding is to discover something, mm -hmm. which is more like science mm -hmm. and less like engineering. And typically funding for universities from companies is you make this sharper or you make this better. It's very directed. And I think directed funding is also very difficult mm -hmm. to do interdisciplinary work. So, so it was the undirected funding and the architecture school mm -hmm. that gave us permission to pull different disciplines together that unlock the media lab yeah. and then I think that you know a Ariel's work started coming out in sort of more of an age of philanthropy in, mm -hmm. in sciences in, in the US right. and also as the commercial businesses are being active but I think maybe exactly. what you're doing with Ar Aurelia and yeah. SCI might be helpful yeah yeah that's absolutely right and we really benefited from the environment that Joey had created with all this interdisciplinary freedom mm -hmm. at the lab I think that is also a really important aspect which is that I felt very free mm -hmm to go work with biologists or pollen artists, and that comes from you know, the leadership at the top saying that that's okay. Mm -hmm. The two ways that we had been trying to do it both at MIT and at Aurelia is one, I think serendipity really helps. So like you have that picture of all of those people together mm -hmm. and being able to actually have some type of a physical location where you are made to sit every day next to people that are doing different disciplines than you, and you don't have to schedule a meeting to go over to the physics department or to go over to the architecture school to make interdisciplinariness happen. Mm -hmm. That has really been a big impact for us is the serendipity. And then the other way that we think about this at Aurelia is it's not enough to say, we're going to do an interdisciplinary project, but all that we care about is if you get published in science mm -hmm. afterwards, because that only works for the scientists. So what we've always tried to do is say, we'll publish in mm -hmm. academic journals, but we'll also deploy so the engineers are happy. Like we'll actually really build stuff and mm -hmm. send it out into space or test it in microgravity. And at the end of the day, we'll reach out to a museum and we'll find out if a museum will do a gallery and show one of the pieces so that the artists and architects on our team are also happy. Mm -hmm. And so being really thoughtful about the um, ways that many different members of the team can share and, and get credit for their work professionally, I think has helped us motivate mm -hmm. truly working together in an interdisciplinary way. Mm -hmm. um, to I, Joey's I, yeah, go ahead. first question, I was actually gonna say, I'm so curious about a lot of your work as well, and I love that you are bringing in geochemistry and biology and, um, you know, these, and physics, because I think that's a, so necessary to understand all the different pieces that go into origin of life. Mm -hmm. A question I had for you, if I may, yeah. can I ask was, um, do you have a take on carbon-based life mm -hmm. versus non-carbon-based life? So do you think it's most likely that in our solar system we'll find it based on some carbon chain, or do you think that there are ways to develop techniques for finding life that's not carbon-based? Yeah, I think in, in the solar system, the carbon is abundant. One is yes. uh, carbon yes. is abundant, right. mm -hmm. and also carbon has oh, sorry, multiple bonds, mm -hmm. so it can create the, the complex functional molecule. 
So I think the advantage of the cur using the carbon mm -hmm. is uh, those elemental property. Okay. And uh, if we see the, the chemical property, the mm -hmm. silicon also has That's very similar yes. uh, property. So in the principle, mm -hmm. the silicon based life could be possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the abundance of silicon is, uh, I mean, Minimal. less abundant compared yes. with carbon. Yeah. And also silicon, in order to, I mean, make a, I mean, fluidization of yeah. silicon yeah. required a, a bit higher temperature. temperature. So that's a two barriers to use, the, I mean, for life to use the silicon at the, the body. But the, right. I think the, yeah, the silicon based life or other elements mm -hmm. uh, based life is possible, mm -hmm. theoretically. Mm -hmm. What yeah. kind of instruments would you like to see on a space habitat? Because if we're building infrastructure for life in space, we'll have a lot of you know, power available, mm -hmm. sensors available. Maybe there are ways to have them do dual purpose mm -hmm. and in the way that the International Space Station has for a long time also be useful as a science platform. What kind of instruments do you think? Uh, for to detect the life, yeah, you know, yeah. A different form of life. I think the one possibility is a, a life always required energy. Mm -hmm. We need to eat something to right. recreate our body and right. to do some activity. So to see the kind of the change in the energy mm -hmm. in, a, I mean, in a growth system mm -hmm. is essential to detect uh, uh, life. For example, if we put some nutrients mm -hmm. or some food for, lo for life, then the life could yes. consume yes. those materials and make a, an energy, mm -hmm. like a heat or movement. So those, the conversion of the elemental mm -hmm. materials to energy, energy. is uh, probably fundamental and the common uh, detection uh, I mean methods. Search yeah. for that signature right. of that energy. Right. Yeah, for sure. And uh, another is the complexity of materials. Mm -hmm. so if life exists, mm -hmm. the I mean complexity of materials increase. Mm -hmm. For example, on Earth, the before the rise of oxygen, the materials is really simple. Mm -hmm. The no oxidant on the surface. But mm -hmm. after the rise of oxygen, of course, the the oxygen is produced by photosynthetic mm -hmm. life, and uh, due to this the formation of uh, the oxygen rich the atmosphere, then the Earth's mineralogical variety increased dramatically. So if life exists, life it itself is complex body, mm -hmm. but uh, any product, any product life produced, it's also very complex. Yeah. So if we can measure the kind of complex index of the mm -hmm. materials or complex index of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. then th that could be a promising indicator for life. So it, it's not only for the materials, but also mm -hmm. for if we create, I mean, life create a civilization, mm -hmm. it's also increase the complexity of the yes. surface materials. Yes. So if we see Earth from the space in the dark side, we can see many light on the surface. Right, right. And also there are yeah, many civilized materials there. <laughs> so that's an <laughs> increase the complexity. So yeah. the measurements of the complexity, mm -hmm. complexity mm -hmm. index is uh, one of the key to find the life. So yeah, so I had a question though uh, on the, your definition of life. So <laughs> um, because in this, um, this hydrothermal environment, um, you have some things that are very, like maybe don't even look like life, but are more complex. Mm -hmm. And is it, it's almost a continuum, mm -hmm. right? Between a complex molecular interaction right. Right. and life, because you have viruses and then right. you have protoviruses. So like, where do you define, <laughs> like how complex do you have to be before you call it life? Okay, so you're, you're asking about the boundary <laughs> of the life and the a, a life yeah <laughs> it's yeah. really hurts us <laughs> to yeah. me but what i'm thinking is uh mm, yeah it's hard to is it there is, so there's no uh ac like a official position in academia of as far as i know it, it's totally there is no consensus yeah. I think it's on that it's still a very but active yeah. argument yeah. yeah yeah because if it's because because you're just i'm not sure where the where the consensus is but the but you were showing, I mean, w we believe that there are many hydrothermal environments in, in, in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on where we set the, the boundary for where we mm -hmm. call life, the number of places where there is life is very different. Mm -hmm. that, that's true, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, uh, and I guess the other question is, what are the ex additional environmental features you need for that to become complex versus just getting stuck mm -hmm. in, a, in a minimal state? Is that, is that is that roughly what, you, like for instance, what do you expect to discover? Um, if, if you discovered something on these uh, 
uh, these um, like Europa or something like that, it's probably going to be quite basic life, right? Mm-hmm. Or do you expect to, you don't expect to find multicellular <laughs> organisms swimming <laughs> around, right? I personally more than the or, or hope, but the, in reality, the global is, uh, yeah, very simple, very simple. basic mm-hmm. life. Yeah. So. Matsui-san mm. said something interesting to me the other evening when we were talking, which is that it's possible that hydrothermal, and you would know much better than I do, but that hydrothermal vents and these other types of geochemistry could be very common in the universe. And we already are seeing all these exoplanets that look like Earth twins. Mm -hmm. But that, so maybe early, early stage, super simple life is common. But to your question about like, when do you get out of that minimum state and become multicellular? It's evolution. And maybe evolution is not a default Mm -hmm. common Mm -hmm. activity. And, and that's, I guess, one of your research areas, right? Mm. Is is when does evolution work and how does it work? And mm. so evolution totally depends on the environment mm-hmm. yes. or mm-hmm. change of fluxion of yeah. the environment. Mm. So it's totally chaotic and yeah. stochastic, even. Mm-hmm. But as right. uh, Arya mentioned, I think that there is a kind of common r- rule or common things for the emergence yeah. of life. But the, the evolution totally depends on the planetary body. Yeah. So we could mm. not yeah. predict. The evolution, because mm-hmm. uh, those environmental yeah. changes like a chaotic. So, yeah. And Could I know we predict evolution though? If you find planets, if we set some threshold for the complexity of the dynamic nature of the planet, like Earth, we have mm. a metal core that's mm. liquid, so it's causing, mm. you know, mm. more activity than and it protecting an atmosphere, unlike Mars. And there's wind and weather. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And uh, on on Earth and the uh, Earth evolution, yeah. the major transition, the first major transition is that we call the Great Oxidation mm-hmm. Event. Right. Uh, it was occurred about 2.5 billion years ago. Mm-hmm. The before the Great Oxidation Event, there is no oxygen in the mm-hmm. atmosphere. Right. Very mm-hmm. the, yeah, primitive world. But after the Great Oxidation Event, the diversity of life, the dramatically increase. So the question is whether we can predict that those yeah. great and oxidation and event and, and we whether can generalize the, yeah. the Earth's history. And, and, and whether it's given, right? yeah. because it was yeah. just one mutation that created it. You can tie oxygenation back to one mm-hmm. cyanobacteria, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and yeah. that it's very unlikely, yeah. but it happened. Yeah. And right. so the question, does it always happen, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the one one hypothesis is that the great oxidation event could be triggered by the snowball earth event. Mm-hmm. The snowball mm-hmm. earth is a global glacial event, mm-hmm. and after the global uh, glacial event, mm-hmm. then the kind of the, the blooming of cyanobacteria occurs. That mm-hmm. caused the great oxidation event. That's still hypothesis, but mm-hmm. the the occurrence of the the snowball earth mm-hmm. state could be predictable. Uh, it it okay. relates to the sun the activity sun. and yeah. also mm-hmm. the the I mean the deca- I mean mantle convection. Mm-hmm. The, if the mantle convection occurs very quickly, then the CO2 always degassing. Mm-hmm. Okay. But uh, the sun's activity increases through the time, so the timing mm-hmm. for the great mm-hmm. oxidation e- event is probably the the highest probability of the occurrence of mm-hmm. snowball Earth. So based on the planet evolution and the stellar evolution, right. we may be able to create the, those dramatic change in the climate. And if, if <laughs> that hypothesis is true, that the hypothesis is that the climate evolution closely relates to the biological evolution. Mm-hmm. If it's true, then we could predict the, the, the I mean, shift in the biological. Like a planetary spring. Yeah, the that's melting. right. Yeah. But so what's your hypothesis on what happened on Mars? Mm-hmm. Why it is less life. Yeah, Mars is m- just much smaller than Earth. So mm. the, the interior activity ceases quickly yeah. after mm. the formation. So mm, that's that's an important question that I've never thought of that. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Mm. Um, just to get back to an earlier point about interdisciplinary work, I, mean, I think that asking an interesting question, mm-hmm. like the origin of life, yes. I think drives people for interdisciplinary because mm-hmm. then you have a goal, mm-hmm. which isn't just to make this sharper or make this more efficient. <laughs> the goal is actually a purpose that then you could use to bring people together who might not otherwise work together, right? And I think that that the, the question is whether that goal is something that the government would fund or whether it's somebody something that philanthropists would fund. But mm-hmm. h- how how do you find people's interest in your goal? Uh, do you find the government and, and mm. the public interested? Yeah, 
in Japan, it's really hard to get uh, a big donation mm -hmm. to the university. It's, I think it's uh, one of the major difference between the US and the Japanese university. The, there is almost no culture of donation in, in Japan, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the, some millionaire or billionaire could <laughs> donate, but uh, usually people do not interested mm -hmm. in the donation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Japan, the, we need to think about the kind of the, the government supported university. So in that sense, the, we need to promote the interdisciplinary research mm -hmm. uh, for, for the origin of life. Uh, through the government fund, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, going going back to the the Joe's point and the, the areas, I mean, in the beginning of this discussion, the LC tried to get the I mean, industry uh, donation mm -hmm. or personal donation, mm -hmm. and uh, we try to I mean, uh, I mean, how to say the the commercialized our science mm -hmm. and to to public. We try to make uh, public lectures mm -hmm. on uh, many SNS activity to mm -hmm. get the, those funds and to get the interest from the, the public. Mm -hmm. So it's just the beginning. So it, it's not like uh, the funding, but uh, in the future, we, we'd like to grow those activity. Mm -hmm. I mean, to attract, to gather the interest of the public, mm -hmm. including the students or the children right. mm -hmm. uh, right. for the science in the future. Uh, did, did I yeah, answer? Yeah, yeah, that's that's very helpful. And and at Chivakodai, one of the things, um, you know, this this university here has funding because it has so many students. And um, Matsui Sang also is able to do a lot of applied work here that would have been difficult in the traditional government funding. Yeah. And I think I that really envy envy <laughs> the <laughs> tax situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so for it's a smaller scale, but I yeah. think we can do some experiments here and maybe at least connect things together and yes. and also you know with Aurelia and the venture funding and right. things like that I think that might be a, another place that you I mean obviously you're being able to do yeah. I can share a little bit about that maybe yeah. I didn't mention in the presentation but we are trying to build an ecosystem that can be reinforcing self reinforcing for space partly because within the space industry we do have this challenge of inconsistent government funding and it seems like you feel the same and so one of the goals of Aurelia, I presented the nonprofit side, the research side. We are raising a VC fund this fall into early next year so that as we incubate really interesting technology that might exist to become a company on the nonprofit side, we can spin that company out and have the venture capital fund ready to invest in that company. The VC fund will also invest in other companies around the world, the US those that are very that fit our investment thesis for infrastructure for life in space and space technologies that would come back down to direct Earth. And what I'm hoping to do with this is I have the MIT arm where we're doing basic research, really exploratory. We have the applied Aurelia nonprofit arm where we're operationalizing a lot of IP, really building things for the future. And then this VC arm that allows me to say, okay, when those pipeline elements become mature enough, I have a way to get them out into society and fund it and on what I hope is a, a track for success. And it has taken me, you know, now I'm in year seven of my time at MIT to think this structure through, but I think this is a hopefully an interesting model for really mm. affecting change in the space industry and starting to mm. catalyze mm -hmm. the different companies and technologies that we need. Sikinyasan, do you work closely with the space industry? Yeah, I, I'm a, uh, I mean, wha what do you say? The, yeah, I work with iSpace. iSpace, yeah, oh, great. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they try to uh, mm -hmm. yeah, launch the spacecraft in the next week. But right. Uh, yeah, but I'm a, a kind of si science support supporter mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the, the iSpace. You should talk them into creating a mission to Enceladus or yeah. Europa <laughs> and take your instrument and take right. Your, right. your science with you, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. yeah, I'm feeling that the uh, Artemis uh, mm. program is a really chance for us. Yeah. I mean, to promote the dramatically promote the the science in the space. Yes. Yes. So the the in the previous ages, the the space exploration was mainly done. I mean, supported were led by right. the government, only government in right. Japan. Right. But in the uh, f in the future, near future, through the Artemis program mm -hmm. the the space industry yes. including the public could be involved in the space exploration in and uh, 
also development. So I right. think it's really good chance for us to involve many people and uh, I mean to cultivate the, those activity, the space yeah. industry activity yeah. in Japan too. I wonder how both of you think about this. In the old days of the space industry, it was easy to get people's attention for Apollo because there were only a few television channels and the nationwide government could make it a priority and everybody was gonna watch and see that. And now it does seem much harder just to capture attention and even for absolutely meaningful, impactful work mm -hmm. like yours or mine or other people's work. I wonder how you guys think about the right ways to capture attention yeah. for your work. Yeah. Um, yeah, that just relates to my, my question to Ariel. But uh, the what is the, the major what could be the major difference between the Apollo and the Artemis? Mm. The Apollo ended for right. some reason. Right. But for Artemis, we should continue. The we Artemis. should continue. So <laughs> the idea is to have yeah. The so the the what is the lessons learned from mm. why the Apollo ended and the, the what would be the the major improvement for the Artemis for the continuous activity in the space exploration. Sure. So my personal take on this is that Apollo was really ahead of its time, just jumped leaps and bounds of where the rest of society was, which is part of why it was so captivating. But there was no economic um, mm. engine behind it. It was the U.S. government. And when we ceased really being so concerned about the Cold War, there wasn't that existential pressure mm -hmm. from Cold War um, tensions pushing us into the space race. Everything relaxed. There was less funding for space, and there wasn't a, um, there were not space entrepreneurs to pick that activity up and keep going with it. This time, the space commercial ecosystem is what's really exciting. Everybody knows about SpaceX and Elon Musk and Bezos and Blue Origin and Axiom now doing a commercial space station. And so, even if Artemis, the government program, was to falter, which knock on wood, we <laughs> want it to really succeed. I think there's enough of a economic ecosystem mm. and other people's vested interests, not just government vested mm -hmm. interests this time, which is what leads me to hope that it wouldn't be the same interregnum mm -hmm. after Artemis again. I agree. Yeah, in order to gather the the interest of the in space industry and also yeah. to activate those those uh, activity, mm -hmm. the what science could play, I mean, what role science could play mm. to just uh, promote the science uh, interest to public, or yeah. what? What else the science could do for the the continuous the space exploration? The space exploration. Yeah. I yeah. think you framed it really beautifully in your talk, which is part of the question I ask: Why and how could we get the attention that we are hoping to get among the public? Is there are so many other existential threats facing humanity right now? Climate change, poverty is still unsolved, and it can sometimes seem. Uh, superfluous to come in as a space person and say, oh yes, that's all important, but I really want to talk about space exploration. And I think you framed it really meaningfully at the beginning of your talk that space exploration on both the science side and the engineering physically taking to people to space side helps us answer really fundamental questions about ourselves. Understanding more about the origin of life is critical for us being able to understand our place in the universe and then understanding where we might go in the future for our horizon. So i thinking that this is the right way to get the public again engaged is to not say that it's space exploration at the cost of doing other critical needs of society. It should be a yes and type of answer, and that we really communicate it as this profound human opportunity. Might work well within a science audience where many of us are intrinsically motivated by this search for knowledge. Um, the other way to approach this is the pragmatic argument, which is just to say, show how many technologies come out as spin-offs from working to get people into space or working within your lab and show society the economic value of those spin-offs or how the Apollo program, for example, launched STEM education in the United States, mm -hmm. which was incredibly impactful, mm -hmm. and go that route more to get voters um, in a more pragmatic way. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that's sort of the pragmatic outcome of big missions or big questions that actually gets back to the original point of pulling people across, across. these um, um, verticals. You know, and I think that in Japan, a lot of it was like rebuilding Japan after yes. the war or big sort of industrial things like building big cars, visions. you know, yes, actually yeah. builds ecosystems. And I think that's the other thing is that large projects, whether even science questions build can build ecosystems and mm -hmm. I think one of the problems 
is that, like, to your point about like modern issues right now, climate right. is, is right. such an important issue that we're trying to figure out, but it's difficult to figure out what to do what to about do. climate because it's such a complex thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that in a way, you know, looking for life, you know, or going to the moon, because the what you're it's trying to do is quite straightforward, right. even though it's right. very difficult, that allows us to self-organize around something. Mm -hmm. But when what we're trying to do is quite un Amorphous. undefined, then it's very yeah. difficult because everybody just kind of works against each other. You know? yeah. I think it's a, I think that's the problem partially is that a lot of our main problems now are complex problems that are the result of oversimplification yes. of things. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, but that's where I think architecture and ecosystems and you know maybe there are, are things from biology that we can learn about how we evolve complex system so there may be a meta meta thing there i love that you had a complexity scientist within your <laughs> yeah. team i was Thank thinking you. that's very, very cool. cool i need one <laughs> that's a really great idea uh, can, can i ask another question to you yeah uh, if we could build the uh, i mean society or mm -hmm. village on the surface of the moon or mm -hmm. in the space uh in the planetary space mm -hmm. that could be a distant mirror of our society on the Earth. It could be a what? A distant mirror. A distant mirror. Yeah, a distant yes. mirror is like, uh, if we see the yes. from those people, the right. how our society could look like. Mm -hmm. So, and that, the making the society or making the village on the right. surface of the moon, let's face it, the, 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 for example, if we try to find the such for extraterrestrial life, this mm -hmm. is the, another question for what is life, as yes. we discussed. So, right. if we create the society, or village, new village, or right. new society on the on the surface of the moon. The what is the what ideal, is yeah, ideal state of the the society? Mm -hmm. We should continue uh, democracy, or mm -hmm. we need modify something in the or current democracy, or uh, what economy we should the promote there? And uh, that's a kind of trigger to mm -hmm. consider ideal state yes. mm -hmm. of humans' uh, life. So is. Is, is there any activity to consider those things and, or yes. it's, it's too early to consider that? I don't think it's too early at all. I love that you bring this up because there are different organizations right now trying to do exactly what you're saying, which is we have this opportunity to take a mirror mm. to our own society and try to, to innovate on fundamental social structures and governance structures. We are doing a little bit of this with an Aurelia to think about if we had a floating microgravity space city, what is the future of urban planning in space? How would we do this differently and learn from the mistakes that cities have made over the last 30 years, becoming more and more impersonal? And then at a government scale, there are groups like Open Lunar doing this to say, how would a society on the moon that's right now looking like it's very likely to be founded by corporate entities because the corporates are getting there first, how do we avoid that becoming uh, what we call in the US a mill town, a town owned by a corporation where they have too much power to exploit their workers? You know, they might control whether you get to go back home to Earth or not. Or on the moon, they might get to control whether you breathe, whether there's enough air in your habitat. Very fundamental concerns. And so Open Lunar is thinking about how do we set interesting precedents for the first few companies to land and set up a small habitat on the moon so that we are pointing ourselves towards more creative, good governance models mm -hmm. and tweaking democracy. We've seen a lot in the US recently around how certain aspects of democracy are struggling and are there tweaks to it that might make it more robust and resilient. I would love to you know, collaborate and think about these questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic that you bring yeah. it up. I don't think it's too early. Mm -hmm. and, and I think science fiction does it fairly well. You know, in some anime in Japan, Daniel Suarez has a yeah. great new book. Delta V. Um, yeah, yeah, Delta V, and he, he just has a new one that oh, just came out oh, okay. um, a few weeks ago um, about you know, the sort of exactly that kind of commercial yeah. uh, ecosystems. Um, so I wonder um, if there's any Questions or comments from the audience. Nihongo demo daijoubu desu ke demo nanka shitsuron ya iken arimasu ka? I'm Peng Hong from the Chiba Institute of Technology. I'm actually the graduate of uh, Professor <laughs> Sekide. And uh, this is kind of a personal question that uh, uh, he said uh, extraordinary. Uh, extraordinary claims uh, require extraordinary uh, discoveries. And uh, it also, I think it also applies to the space mission to uh, uh, f uh, for the next generation. And uh, uh, if uh, there 
was a manned mission to Mars. Uh, will you apply to the yeah. mission by yourself? And why do you think that? By yourself? Yes. A well, solo uh, mission? Uh, I mean, uh, will you apply to the mission? Would, would you apply yourself? Oh, I would <coughs> so. Okay. Uh, do you want to? To both this? of you. You mean uh, apply as a clue of the, yes. the human? Uh, uh, yes, as a clue. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, <laughs> as long as I got to come back. Like, the intention was to get to come back. Because uh, there have been proposals for going there and living there for the rest of your life. That I would not do. But as long as I got to come back. I guess it's more expensive to bring you back. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> but yeah if it's a mission to Europa, ah. uh, the, my answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. That's very interesting. What about you, Joey? Uh, probably no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, and that movie, The Martian, was a good movie. I think <laughs> everyone at MIT loves the movie. The Martian, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> it's by but Andy Weir. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's scary. It's scary. Oh, okay, thank you. すみません、日本語でもよろしいでしょうか。立場工業大学工学部の3年生の高橋一子と申します。えっと今お話をすみませんあの英語があの堪能ではないのでいつら聞いていてえっと今後えっと宇宙宇宙産業を拡大する上でえっと学生に求めていくものとして、えっと幅広い知識を持った学生なのかそれともより多くの学生にえっと
uh, can you help me translate? Mm -hmm. A trunk of a tree, you have one area that you feel very confident in is mm -hmm. your expertise area. I very much like his answer, 80-20. And then the branches of the tree are where you let yourself go out and learn how to branch out and collaborate with a different field. Mm -hmm. And so you should, by the end of your life, have a very rich, full tree, but you've always had that anchor of your trunk, your expertise. Or T-shape, right? A T-shape, yeah. yeah. で彼女が言ってるのはこれうちのメディアラボの一つの特徴だったんですけどもあの彼女は「木」って言ってるんですけども僕は「T」ってよく言うんですけどやっぱりすごく深いこと一つは自分持っていてそれが自分のこの根っこでトランクで,でそこから他とつながるためにこう横に動けるような感じで,でメディアラボだとこう深いところがあってでもこのレイヤーではみんなとつながるでそれでいろんな専門の人たちがつながり合うことがすごく重要で,であの多分あの LC でもそういう人間じゃない多分来ないよね、うんうん、そうですね、うん、はいおっしゃった。I completely agree、yeah.。The idea of the T。Yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah.、Okay. Thank you for the question. ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。あの、I would like to give、uh, just a comment、uh, after listening your talk. And、uh, yeah, I'm a postdoc researcher working at here,、uh, primary exploration research center of here this CIT. And、uh, yeah, I I should be,、uh, I, I, may, I may be the traditional subdivided person <laughs> working through the very specific、uh, space expo exploration project.、Uh, some documentation work, paying through、uh, negotiation <laughs> with the、uh, manufacturer、uh, between the JAXA people. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, have, been, I have been recently、uh, focused too much on such specific work. So,、yeah, just, just my comment is.、Uh, Yeah, thank you for giving such、uh, more some, yeah, interdisciplinary talk.、Uh, it's very stimulating、uh, talk for me.、Uh, yeah, that, so,、mm -hmm. yeah, that's my、so、<laughs> comment. Thank you for I coming. Thank you, too. I hope we can get both of them more involved with Ch Chiba Kogyo Daigaku. And、yeah. I'm talking to Matsui san about doing more collaborations with the Henkaku Center. So、yeah. maybe we can follow up and See how we can work together, and maybe some percentage, maybe five percent of your effort, we can do <laughs> on some of that T part, and、mm -hmm. that, would, that would be. Yoroshiku n e g a i s h i m a s So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And、uh, nice. hopefully, we will, this will be the beginning of a、uh, collaboration. Yoroshiku n e g a i s h i m a s Thank you. Thank you very much.